Well, this year is the uh, centenary of the 1924 Olympic Games at which Eric Little famously won a gold medal competing in the uh, 400 metres after refusing to take part in the 100 metres because its heats took place on a Sunday. A story which was immortalised in the film Chariots of Fire. And he never competed in the Olympics again and the following year he travelled to China to begin working as a missionary which he continued to do until his death in 1945. So the 1924 Paris Olympics proved to be the triumphant ending to Eric Liddell's career as an Olympian. In this morning's reading, the Apostle Paul is coming to the end of his majestic chapter on the resurrection. And we've been in this chapter 15 since Easter Sunday, but now the end is in sight as Paul is about to move on to another subject. And uh, before and shortly he will finish the letter. But with, a, with an eye on what he has already written, Paul in these eight verses that uh, Lucy read to us wants to conclude, like Eric Little did in the Paris Olympics of 1924, with the triumphant ending. And that's our sermon title for this morning, the triumphant ending, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 57. And in this morning's passage, Paul summarises and reinforces all he has written earlier in the chapter, and he signs off in verse 57 on a note of triumph. <clears throat> However, before we go through these verses together, we'll just do a, a quick recap of where we left off two weeks ago. And in the section 35 to 49, Paul is answering two questions the Corinthian skeptics had been asking about the dead rising. Firstly, how are the dead raised? And Paul answers, well, in the same way, as the natural world around you. Resurrection, new life coming from old is everywhere about you. A seed is sown and dies in a field so wheat can grow. An acorn dies and so an oak tree can rise up. Death is the precondition for new life to follow. Well, secondly, they ask, with what kind of body will the resurrected come? Well, that's simple, says Paul, with a, with a body that's suited to its environment. Like a fish has a body suited to its environment of the sea, or like a bird has a body suited to its environment of the air. What is more? The resurrected body will be in every way superior to the natural body you are born with. The natural body is perishable. It's made that way. It goes into a steady decline. It is subject to disease and decay, and it eventually dies. The spiritual body you're raised with, on the other hand, is imperishable. There is no inevitability of decline. The spiritual body goes on and on into eternity. We are born then with a body like that of the first Adam but will be raised with a body like that of the last Adam, Jesus. And Paul now brings his argument for the resurrection of the dead to the triumphant ending, which I would like us to look up at under five headings. Firstly, in verse 50, Paul reiterates what I've called the underlying principle. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Paul has already made this declaration when answering the question in verse 35, what kind of body will they come, will, will they come with? 
But Paul wants to, to, to restate what he said using different language. And so he says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, our current bodies are not suited to God's new creation. To put it crudely, our earthly bodies are made of the wrong stuff. It's not a matter of God resurrecting our old bodies from the grave. The idea is that they will be reawakened one day to receive their new bodies. No the, no, the, sorry. no, the Christian needs a new body fit for the heavens, the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let me illustrate it like this. You may be fit and fast enough to run to catch a bus, but you're not fit and fast enough to run in the 100 metres in the Olympics and to compete against Usain Bolt at his peak. No, that requires a different level of fitness and speed on a completely different scale. Let me illustrate it like this. A pair of open toe sandals is perfectly good footwear for the beach, but a pair of sandals is not suitable for serious hill walking. You need the appropriate footwear for more challenging walking. And likewise, the new creation is an entirely new dimension of life. It will be nothing like this life on earth. Therefore, an earthly body which has been subject to decline, decay and death is not fit for an eternal world. In Paul's words, the perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. Some have objected when they read this, and said, well, if flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, we'll, we'll just be spirits. We'll just be like ghosts floating around. There will be no physicality in our bodies. But that is not what Paul means. The resurrected body will be a physical body. Just as the resurrected Jesus had a physical body, which was recognizable to his disciples, and which was something that he invited them to touch and to feel to prove that he was alive. The resurrected body will be a physical body, but it will be a different body to the one we indwell now. Andrew Wilson, the scholar, puts it very well in his commentary. He writes this, lightweight bodies of death do not belong in a heavyweight world of life. That's the underlying principle then. The heavenly kingdom is not made for the kind of bodies that we have now. We will need new ones. But secondly, Paul introduces us to what I've called the mystery in verse 51 and the trumpet in verse 52. Well, what is the mystery? Well, the mystery is the instant transformation of the body. The verb sleep in verse 51, of course, is a euphemism for death. It's a bit like when we say somebody has passed away and deceased Christians in the New Testament then were said to be sleeping. It was how Jesus described Lazarus in the tomb. He wasn't dead, he was sleeping. And the idea is that they will one day be reawakened to receive their new bodies. But the mystery is this, that they will all be transformed, both the dead in Christ and the still living in Christ. And the transformation will happen in a flash, as the church Bible puts it in verse 52, or in a moment, as the more literal translation of the English Standard Version puts it. The Greek word is atmos, from which we get our word in English, atom. And so Paul is saying that it will take only a tiny particle of time 
for this transformation to happen, like the twinkling of an eye. I enjoy watching clips from the old Superman films of the late 1970s and early 1980s, starring the late Christopher Reeve. And when disaster struck in Metropolis, in an instant, our hero would shed his civilian clothes of Clark Kent and would be in his uniform of Superman. And that's what Paul is getting at here. The transformation will be in the blink of an eye. It will be within a heartbeat. <coughs> but when will the mystery be revealed? Well, the signal for the revelation of the mystery will be the last trumpet, verse 52. Now, here's the thing. The prophets Isaiah and Zechariah also speak of the trumpet sound of God announcing the salvation of his people. Jesus, too, speaking of the end times, declares how the Son of Man will come with power and great glory and will send his angels with a loud trumpet call to gather his elect from all over the earth, Matthew 24. Paul, therefore, has not invented the idea of the trumpet call to announce the coming of the Lord. No, it was already a biblical image. But as far as Paul is concerned, the last trumpet will sound for the last battle to commence, for the last enemy, death, to be defeated. The last trumpet will be like the firing of a starting gun beginning a race, or like the blowing of a referee's whistle beginning a football match. The only difference being the victor is preordained. So we have the underlying principle, the mystery and the trumpet. And then thirdly, in verses 53 and 54, the new set of clothes. What is it that mums say to their sons when they begin in the world of work. Clothes make the man. Son, your clothes make a statement about who you are. Dress shabbily and you will give the impression you will work shabbily. In 2015, Formula One World racing champion Lewis Hamilton obviously hadn't spoken to his mum beforehand when he was denied entry to the Royal Box at Wimbledon for not adhering to the strict dress code of a jacket, shirt and tie for men. It didn't matter how successful he had been or how famous he was, he wasn't allowed in. How you dress what you put on matters. I cannot tell you how many times my wife says to me, dress yourself properly, or you're not going out like that, are you? Wives seem to take over, don't they, where mothers leave off. <laughs> and Paul uses the analogy of clothing to, to describe the transformation which will take place at the sound of the last trumpet. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. An earthly set of clothes will be replaced by an eternal set of clothes. A transient set of clothes will be replaced by a permian set of clothes. The Greek, word, the Greek verb enduo, to clothe, to put on, is actually one of Paul's favourite words in his contribution to the New Testament. Enduo, the Greek word, gives us our word in English, endu. And enduo frequently appears in Paul's letters. So he writes to the Romans, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. To the Ephesians, he writes, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. 
And then again to the Ephesians, put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the evil devil's schemes. And then to the Colossians, clothe yourselves then with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. It's only when this reclothing has taken place that the perishable being replaced by the imperishable and the mortal by the immortal that Isaiah's prophecy, which Paul references in verse 54, you know, death has been swallowed up in victory. It's only then that the prophecy will be fulfilled. Then Isaiah's words will no longer be prophetic. They will have come to pass. Death will be swallowed up like it disappearing into a giant sinkhole. The underlying principle, the mystery and the trumpet, the new set of clothes. And then fourthly, we see in verse 55, the taunting of death. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Sigmund Freud, widely regarded as the founder of modern psychiatry, said this about death. And finally, there is the painful riddle of death, for which no remedy at all has yet been found, nor probably ever will be. There is not one person who has ever lived who has not had to face up to the, what Sigmund Freud calls the painful riddle of death. Even the most privileged of people are not immune from the sting of death. The commentator and Preacher Roger Ellsworth has written this powerful observation about death. Death has played a monstrous role in each of our lives. It has deprived us of our loved ones, many of them taken well before their time. It's terrorized us, tyrannized us, and caused our feeble hearts to tremble. It has diminished our joys, casting a dark shadow over our happiest moments. There has never been so much as a single hour in which we have not been in some way reminded of it hovering menacingly on the horizon. And death has been portrayed like as the, the playground bully before whom all the other children in the playground cower. Just like how the giant Goliath, the Philistine, stood up and challenged the soldier of Israel, terrifying them and causing their hearts to sink. But now the Goliath of death has met his match. But now the Goliath of death has met his David and has been defeated. Now the one stronger than death has come along and has removed it from its throne. So... The words of verse 55, which Paul again borrows, this time from the prophet Hosea, are his taunting of death. Paul mocks death. He scorns it. He sneers at it. He scoffs at it. And he says, you thought that you were invincible. You thought that you were impregnable. You thought that you were indestructible. But you're wrong. Your victory is hollow. Your sting has been taken away. And Paul is like the football fans taunting the fans of their team's opponents. What do they chant to the opposing fans if their team has an unassailable lead in the match? You only sing when you are winning. Or perhaps you're not singing anymore. And that is what Paul is saying about to death. You're not singing anymore. You're not crowing anymore. You're not bragging anymore. You've been dethroned and you've been defeated. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The underlying principle, the mystery and the trumpet, the new set of clothes, the taunting of death, and then finally, in verses 56 and 57, the glorious victory. In verse 56, Paul tells us who the vanquished are. 
In verse 57, Paul tells us who the instigator of the victory is. And the vanquished are this triad of the law, sin and death. There's a vicious circle of the law, sin and death. Together they form a lethal combination. But God's law sure, surely is a good thing, isn't it? You may ask. After all, doesn't the psalmist say, Oh, how I love your law, I meditate it on it all day long. Yes, of course, God's law and the summary of it in the Ten Commandments is a good thing. And we would all do well to meditate on it. The law reveals to us the character of God. It is the yardstick of God's perfect righteousness. But there's a downside to the law. It defines sin for us. It reveals to us just how far short of God's glory we fall. It's like a mirror. I look in the mirror and it shows up all my physical imperfections. The bags under my eyes. My middle-aged spread. My wrinkles. My follically challenged head. Likewise, the law is a mirror which reflects all our moral imperfections. It's the law which tells us that we're sinners. It's the law which pronounces us as guilty. It's the law which gives sin its power. The law says, do not covet your neighbor's house. And immediately you feel the urge to do so. The law says, do not look at a woman lustfully. And immediately you feel the essential juices rising up within you to do so. It is sin which leads to death. For as Paul famously writes to the Romans, the wages of sin is death. Therefore, this, this, this combination of the law, sin and death has a stranglehold on anyone who has ever lived. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But this vicious circle has been defeated. There is an antidote to the sting of death. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. On the cross, Jesus died as our representative and substitute. The sinless Son of God offered his life of perfect obedience to the Father in the place of our rebellious hearts and stubborn wills. He bore our punishment. He made full atonement for our sins. He satisfied the law's just demands. He defeated death by nullifying its sin sting. The Apostle Peter, drawing from the prophet Isaiah, writes this in his first letter. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Charles Wesley puts it very well in verse. Death, hell and sin are now subdued. All grace is now to sinners given. And lo, I plead the atoning blood and in your right I claim your heaven. This, then, is the triumphant ending of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in terms of theology. There's one further verse to come in terms of application, which I'm saving for next week. So there's the underlying principle. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There's the mystery and the trumpet. All Christians will be transformed with resurrection bodies when Jesus comes Again, at the sound of the last trumpet. There's the new set of clothes, a new body, which all Christians will put on for eternity. There's the taunting of death. Death has no longer a hold on the believer. As death has lost its sting, Paul feels perfectly justified in taunting it. There's the glorious victory, the domino effect of the law, sin and death has been overcome. Death has been defeated. The painful riddle of death, as Sigmund Freud put it, has been solved. 
when 40 years ago now, I served with the London City Mission, there was a girl in the team for Tregiga in the Welsh Valleys called Helen. I can picture her very clearly in my mind. She was a gifted musician with a wonderful singing voice. And I can vividly remember her playing her guitar and singing 715 in Mission Praise during our times of group praise and worship. And it has these words which just encapsulate Paul's triumphant ending. Victory is on our lips and in our lives, for Jesus has surely been raised from the dead. And never shall the powers of darkness doubt that Jesus is Lord over all. Neither shall the powers of darkness triumph. For Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord over all. The triumphant ending of 1 Corinthians 15 is what I read on Thursday at Sydney's funeral. Sydney is present with the Lord. But at the last trumpet, when Jesus comes again in glory, Sydney will be reclosed in a new body, not in the same body which very nearly got to him to 103, but in a body which will never wear out and which will last into eternity. How is this possible? It's entirely down to our God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory over death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.